December 30th, 1903, 2,200 visitors packed into the newly built Iroquois Theater on a chilly Chicago afternoon. Consisting of mostly women and children, the crowd found their way to their seats within the theater's three levels of seating. Excitedly, they awaited the start of the children's comedy production called Mr. Bluebeard starring Dan McAvoy and Eddie Foy. The play featured physical comedy elements, actors dressed as animals, as well as some acrobatics with ballerinas rigged up to fly over the stage. The number of visitors far exceeded the seating capacity of the building, so hundreds occupied the standing room areas in the back. At 3.15 p.m., shortly into the play's second act, one of the spotlights short-circuited and let off some sparks, which quickly ignited a curtain in the backstage area. The fire that was burning in an area cluttered with wooden props and oily rags was noticed by one of the spotlight operators. However, the actors were not concerned. Fires in theaters were fairly common, but the Iroquois Theater was touted by the Chicago Building Commissioner, George Williams, as being fireproof beyond all doubt, a sentiment that was constantly tossed around and widely believed, even by the performers. After all, the building was equipped with six Kill Fire fire extinguishers and featured a built-in asbestos curtain that hung above the stage. This asbestos curtain was supposedly capable of swiftly snuffing out a flame. As the fire slowly spread, one of the main actors in the production and well-known comedy actor Eddie Foy came out in his costume to soothe the audience and prevent them from panicking. While he did this, the Kill Fire fire extinguishers were deployed. But this type of fire extinguisher is not like the ones we are currently familiar with. The user must actually toss the contents of the extinguisher at the base of the flame to smother it. Since the flame was high above the stage, the Kill Fire fire extinguisher was completely ineffective. The contents simply fell to the ground. They then attempted to use the asbestos curtain. They tugged at it to pull it down, but it became stuck. It snagged on a light reflector, so their second line of defense was also rendered useless against the building fire. As it turns out, it wouldn't have really mattered anyway, as later evaluation proved that the asbestos curtain was actually made from wood pulp mixed with asbestos. Essentially, it was paper laden with asbestos and would have been completely useless against a fire. With the fire still spreading, the crew began to realize that they were powerless to stop it. The dancers and stagehands panicked and decided to flee the building from the oversized door in the back that was used to bring large props backstage. The moment it opened, the cold wind from outside blasted into the theater and created a backdraft effect. A backdraft is a phenomenon which occurs when a sudden burst of oxygen is introduced into a place with limited ventilation, causing rapid, potentially explosive acceleration of a flame. A fireball violently ripped through the backstage area and immediately set off a panic. Audience members fled toward the exits. This is where the flaws of the building's fire preparedness became exposed. The theater's design featured a single staircase which led to each of the balconies. This was directly out of compliance with Chicago's fire ordinances, which required a separate staircase and exit for each balcony. Still, one of the building's biggest boasts in regard to its superior fire safety was the fact that it had 30 fire exits, more than any other theater in the world. These exits, however, were mostly hidden behind draperies and were completely unmarked as the owners did not want them to detract from the show. Furthermore, when the exits were finally discovered, they were found to be locked by giant deadbolt locks. These locks were installed to keep people from sneaking into the play without paying, and also to prevent people from switching to more expensive seats during intermission. The teenage ushers responsible for unlocking the emergency exits had panicked and fled the theater at the earliest opportunity. With the theater rapidly becoming engulfed in flames, 
people were trapped on the balcony levels with no means of egress. On the bottom floor, the few doors that were opened had a four-foot drop to the pavement, which significantly slowed the evacuation process. On the balcony floors, those fleeing kept finding themselves staring at locked doors. A few balcony doors, however, had been forced open by the violent backdraft. Through it, patrons fled onto the fire escape on the side of the building, only to find that the fire escape was not completed and did not have a way to the ground. Desperate, some of the theater goers jumped to their deaths in an attempt to escape. As the dead end fire escape was not large enough to hold all the building's occupants, others were getting knocked off as people continued to flee out onto it. On the ground near the balcony exits, bodies of people who either jumped or were knocked down in the scramble were found, piled six feet high in what would later be dubbed Death's Alley by the newspapers. It just so happened that there were some workers cleaning the Northwestern University building across the alley. Thinking quickly in an attempt to help, they straddled boards across the alleys for people to cross to safety. While this did save a few lucky individuals, many were unable to make it across. In all, over 600 people died in the blaze by being burned, through asphyxiation, or being crushed to death by the stampede of panicked theatergoers. One unfortunate ballerina, Nellie Reed, who was supposed to fly out over the crowd and shower them with pink carnations, fell from her rigging in the panic and died from her injuries. Most of the staff and actors made it out safely. Only five of the 300 did not survive. In his memoirs, Eddie Foy recalled, a mad, animal-like stampede, their screams, groans, and snarls, the scuffle of thousands of feet and bodies grinding against bodies merging into a crescendo, half wail, half roar. To put the depth of this awful disaster into perspective, it doubled the number of victims in the Great Chicago Fire of 1871, which had claimed 300 lives. As with so many other claims which tempted fate, the Iroquois Theater's claim to be fireproof was proven tragically inaccurate. So many things went wrong. The theater was built during a period of labor unrest, which caused delays in the building process due to a shortage of workers. Still, this didn't deter the theater owners who wanted to open the theater before the cold winter set in so they could attract more patrons. This led to cutting corners in the building process, like the incomplete fire escapes. This is an astonishing revelation for a building touted so highly as being fireproof. Fire safety inspections performed prior to the opening of the Iroquois Theater revealed many blatant violations, including the presence of wood trim on everything, insufficient provisions of exits, no telephones, no sprinklers, no water connections, and no fire alarms. In fact, the lack of fire alarms is one of the most significant factors in the deadly outcome of the fire. The Chicago Fire Department was not able to make it on scene until it was far too late. By the time they did arrive, the victims were already dead. This is because one of the stagehands had to run down the street after escaping himself to trip a manual fire alarm to alert the fire department. A captain of the Chicago Fire Department attempted to make the fire safety issues known, but was dismissed by the theater's fire warden, who said that nothing could be done about it. When the captain attempted to inform his own commanding officer, he was again met with resistance and told the theater already had a fire warden. The resistance was the result of the owners of the theater. The fire warden knew that the owners would have no interest in addressing the issues. Instead, they were more interested in getting the theater open to the public on time. Following the fire, there were a number of accusations of corruption. It was alleged that the fire inspectors took bribes to overlook the code violations. This is especially confounding considering the insistence by Mayor Carter Harrison IV ordering safety reviews of all Chicago theaters in the months prior to the Iroquois Theater opening. 
Despite this, the theater only went through a cursory safety inspection before opening on November 23rd, 1903, just five weeks before the fire. Mayor Harrison, along with many others, including the owners of the Iroquois Theater, were charged with crimes. However, charges were dropped on all of them, except for one person, who looted the dead bodies. There were a shocking number of deficiencies in the building in regard to fire safety, which attributed to the vast number of victims. No emergency lighting, no established escape routes, unmarked and locked exits, incomplete fire escapes, no sprinklers or alarms, exit doors that opened inwards, and ornamental doors that looked like exits but were not. Although this disaster happened so long ago, these dangers were known at the time and simply ignored. As a direct result of the Iroquois Theater, the panic bar and outward opening doors became much more widespread as a fire safety measure. Additionally, some theaters eliminated standing room. Cities all over the US and Europe reformed building and fire codes based on what was learned from this catastrophe in Chicago. They immediately closed their theaters to update and retrofit safety measures, such as marking emergency exits and ensuring doors opened in the direction of egress. While the advent of these sweeping changes to fire safety is promising, the cost to get there was far too high. One can only hope that we take these hard lessons to heart and continue to learn from them. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. Hit the bell icon to get notifications when I release a new video. If you're interested in supporting Motive Horror and gaining access to exclusive perks and merchandise, use the link in the description to become a patron of my Patreon. Until next time.